started out down a dirty road. I started out all alone, and the sun went down as I crossed the Our speaker today is Emily Quarles Mauer. Emily is a long, lifelong Unitarian Universalist and currently worships with the UU Fellowship of Pottstown, where she has been an active member of the worship committee for over nine years. Let us welcome her to our sacred space. Our opening words this morning are from Paul Haro. We gather in community to rest from our labors, to greet our neighbors, and to open our being to insight and intuition of that greater reality of which we are all a part. May we find in our time together inspiration and renewal. May we touch the holy in each other and be touched by the graciousness of life. May we find here, here, a calm peacefulness that will carry us through the days ahead. Amen. I can almost see it, that dream I'm dreaming, but there's a voice inside my head saying, you'll never reach it. Every step I'm taking, I make feels lost with no direction. My faith is shaking, but I, I gotta keep trying. Gotta keep my head held high. It's always gonna be another mountain. I'm always gonna. 
So for a reading this morning, I have something out of this little book, Roller Skating as a Spiritual Discipline, which is lovely. I love it. Meditations by Christopher Buse. And I wasn't sure which one I was going to read today because he has a lot of really good options, one about walking in the woods to keep with the walking theme. But the one that I think fits best today is called A Trip to the Mosque. What do Muslims imagine God to look like? The question was asked by a young boy in our Unitarian Universalist Sunday School class when we were visiting the local mosque. We were meeting together with a Muslim religious education class. A young girl from the mosque replied, Well, there is a saying in our religion, whatever you imagine God to be, he is the opposite. And so if you then imagine God to be the opposite of the thing you first imagined, you must imagine that God is the opposite of that. Or in other words, there, there is no way for us to know what God looks like. Another student, a Muslim boy, said, God is a being that is neither male nor female, but like many other religions, we use the word he. And another student said, we have a saying in our tradition that you cannot see God with your outer eye, but you can see him with your inner eye or you can see God in the orderliness of the universe. After the question and answer session was over, we went into the main room where an imam led prayers in Arabic. The assembled worshipers were from Africa, India, Persia, the Middle East, America. People from all over the earth were bowing in the same direction and worshiping the same God. And after the prayers, we reassembled in the classroom where we discovered that Unitarian Universalist kids and Muslim kids share a common ground in a love of donuts. <laughs> the people at the mosque were warm and friendly. I talked with one of the youth about his experiencing fasting during the month of Ramadan. After our social time, a leader from the mosque gave the class a beautifully bound hardback copy of the Quran written in Arabic with an English translation. It was a gift to our church. When I left the mosque with the copy of that Quran in my arms, I was aware that it was one of many gifts that I had received that day. So we had Miley Cyrus uh, lead us in a little meditation before. We're going to have Carol King lead us now.
On the path. So my inspiration for today's talk is a sign I saw on the side of the road in someone's lawn. You may have seen a copy of the sign in your newsletter. It says in Spanish and in English and in Arabic, no matter where you're from, we're glad that you're our neighbor. So I noticed it once and I thought, oh, that's a really nice sign. And then I saw it again, and then I saw it again, and then I came to church in my church in Pottstown, and they were selling the signs. And I thought, where did they come from? Well, the story of this sign, as told by Camilla Dominowski of NPR, starts with Pastor Matthew Butcher of Emmanuel Mennonite in Harrisburg, Virginia. Pastor Butcher was disappointed by the rhetoric of the primary debates last year. Who wasn't? Um, His church is in the northeast part of Harrisonburg, which over the past couple of decades has gone from being primarily African-American to being African-American and Central American and Middle Eastern. And so his church, he, he was noticing this and he wanted to do something nice. So his church put up a sign and he chose Spanish and English and Arabic for the message because those were the three predominant languages spoken in his neighborhood. And Spanish-speaking members of his church translated the message, his original message, into Spanish. And some of his friends who were from Egypt helped with the Arabic translation. So already this project of just one little sign was bringing together different communities. And it might have stopped there. But he had a group of local Mennonite pastors who met in his church to find a way to say something positive. And as Nick Meyer, pastor of the early church in Harrisonburg, put it, um, they wanted to say something positive. Well, they saw that sign and they said, that is something positive. And he called his friend Alex Gore and they put together a layout for some simple, colorful yard signs and they printed up about 200 of them for the pastors to hand out at their local churches. Well, the 200 signs became 300 signs and the 300 signs became a Facebook page with a PDF attached And the message has been spreading by word of mouth and Facebook and all over. So there are signs as far away as Canada, just from this one person who was saying, you know what, no matter where you're from, we're glad you're a neighbor. Now, critics have said that putting up a sign is not really taking action. What I have to say to that is, me putting an inspirational quote on my refrigerator is not doing a diet. But how much easier is it to put down my pint of Ben and Jerry's after I read something that says, treat your body like it belongs to someone you love? So another sign that you might be seeing around, maybe without even noticing that what you're seeing is a sign, is a simple safety pin. Have any of you seen the safety pins? Um, photographer Cass Bird wrote a lovely post, which is available on Instagram, that says what the safety pin movement says to her. And what she says is, 
If you wear a hijab, I'll sit with you on the train. If you're trans, I'll go to the bathroom with you. If you're a person of color, I'll stand with you if the cops stop you. If you're a person with disabilities, I'll hand you my megaphone. If you're an immigrant, I'll help you find resources. If you're a survivor, I will believe you. If you're a ref refugee, I will make sure that you are welcome. If you're a veteran, I will take up your fight. If you're LGBTQ, I won't let anyone tell you you're broken. If you're a woman, I'll make sure you get home okay. If you're tired, me too. If you need a hug, I've got an infinite supply. If you need me, I'll be with you. All I ask is that you be with me too. All that said by one little safety pin. The New York Times article on this trend interviews, among other people, a 52-year-old truck driver named Robert Clark. And what he says is, the pin isn't a signal of allegiance to those he encounters, but a constant reminder to himself. A big part of wearing it, he says, is the mental preparation on my part. If I do see something, I've thought it through, and I'll stand up and not be a silent witness. A reminder to stand up. Small things that we see around us every day are guideposts that remind us of who we want to be. Another sign that influenced me is a little tile that hangs in my older daughter's room. My mother was a big collector of tiles, and after she passed, I inherited a whole, whole bunch of them, and I whittled it down so I only have a few. But this one hangs up, and it's got a big horse's head on it, which is why it hangs in my daughter's room. She loves horses. And it says, Do not go where the path may lead. Go instead where there is no path, and leave a trail. Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now the con conservationist in me cringes at that. <laughs> Do you know what would happen if every visitor to Yosemite didn't stay on the path? But as long as I'm taking this quote metaphorically, it's fine. Life is so often called a journey. And let's face it, there is only one destination and we are not in any hurry to get there. So what really matters on our journey is the path we take what we do with that time we've been given. So there are lots of religions that have journeys as a part of their faith. The indigenous people of Australia have a tradition of temporary mo mobility, which is sometimes called walkabout. I and mean, they don't really use the term walkabout anymore since walkabout now is kind of synonymous with AWOL, absent without leave. Um, so what they now call it is temporary mobility, where young men are sent on long walks to follow what they call dream lines between cultural sites. So these cultural sites actually, you, you think it's kind of, from the term walkabout, you would think it's kind of aimless. It's not actually aimless. They have cultural sites that have um, like very valuable resources, so like protein sources or water sources, and the dream lines actually connect these sources. So they're not just sending the kid out, woo, go and survive. They actually are sending them out to say, follow the path so that you can learn these different things that will help you to survive on your own. I didn't know that. I, I really did think walkabout was just, you know, walking around. Native Americans and First Nations peoples also have their own traditions, which we often lump together with the English term vision quests. Um, and they have it's similar things, vision quests. But just as an aside, did you know that Native American spiritual practices were actually illegal until 1978? There was a law in 1978 that said we can no longer discriminate against these practices. As in, we were doing it before and it was great, but now it's not okay. The United States, which was founded on religious liberty, was discriminating against people up until 1978. Anyhow. But walking, walking is a core part of each of these traditions. And there's something about walking that connects us to our deeper selves. 
Did you ever have a problem? Maybe you were looking for, you know, just the right way to word an email, or maybe there was a puzzling piece of data that just wouldn't fit. So you got up from your chair, you walked maybe to the break room or the coffee pot, and you were halfway to your destination, and you thought, aha! And the solution just popped into your head. These aha moments don't actually have to be just a happy coincidence. People have been touting the benefits of walking at work for years. In a 2015 New York Times article, Gretchen Reynolds reported on a study of office workers who took 30 minutes away from their desks three times a week to go for a walk. And the way they did this was they actually had people, um, they had an app, so they would ask them right in the moment how they were feeling. And that's a lot more accurate than um, having people self-report like two days later because you don't exactly remember how you were feeling that 10 minutes on your lunch break like three days later when you're filling out a survey. I felt great. Sure. So what they found was that on the afternoons after they had the lunchtime stroll, walkers said that they felt more enthusiastic, less tense, and more relaxed and able to cope with their lives on afternoons um, when they had walked than when they hadn't walked. And that was even compared to their mood on the same day before they walked and after they walked. So the really interesting thing about this study was that they found out all this great data about how people do so much better after they've been walking. And what did the employers say? Sorry, we really expect our employees to work through lunch. One way to approach a meaningful journey is through purposeful walking. Because yesterday was World Labyrinth Day. Did you guys know that, World Labyrinth Day? <laughs> now we know. Um, it's celebrated on the first Saturday of May in each year. I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about labyrinths, which are a way of doing purposeful walking. A labyrinth is a tool that, um, a brief history, it's a very ancient tool. There was a figurine depicting a labyrinth-like structure that was found in the Ukraine that dated back to 15,000 BC. These are old tools. Um, they can't actually date people walking a labyrinth that far back, but they have found labyrinths that date back to 4,500 BC. And labyrinths aren't just a Western culture thing. Um, there have been labyrinths found in cultures all over the world. They find them in Peru. They find them in Crete. They find them, um, the Native American Tohono O'odham people, which I just butchered the pronunciation, I'm sorry. The people of the Sonoran Desert, they, they use labyrinths. They have petroglyphs in Goa, India of labyrinths. And there were many, many labyrinths that are found on the shorelines of Sweden and Finland and Estonia. So a labyrinth, just so you know, is a little different from a maze. Um, a maze is kind of a puzzle. You probably did them as kids. You have an entrance and then a whole bunch of twists and turns and dead ends, and you have to try to get yourself out of the maze. And it's a puzzle that's supposed to engage your mind. A labyrinth is different because a labyrinth has just one entrance and exit, so you come in the same way you go out, and there's just one path. And that path twists and turns and spirals around. You get close to the center, you go far away from the center, but it's all one path. You come in and you rest, and then you go out the same way you come in. Um, Dan Johnson said in his Labyrinth Society conference address, a labyrinth is an archetypal symbol. It has an energy with which we can have a direct experience. Unlike many other archetypes which remain abstract, we can physically get into and walk around in a labyrinth. It's a symbol that creates a sacred space and place and takes us out of our ego into our deeper self. And if you're open to the process, walking the labyrinth calls forth its energy to put into your life. So the reason it's considered a symbol of, of birth and life is because there's only one way in and one way out. Just like you don't have more than one entrance and exit to life. It's all the same thing. 
And if you've ever seen a traditional Crete labyrinth with the seven turns, it looks kind of like a tree or kind of like a human brain. It's, it's a very interesting flowing shape. So because of World Labyrinth Day, I walked a labyrinth yesterday on the Pottstown Fellowship's Labyrinth. And when I walked, I brought my older daughter. She's six. So to prepare her for the labyrinth, we talked about the labyrinth in the morning. We said, you know, it's a really ancient thing. It's really cool. We, it's like a meditation you can use to walk. And we traced a paper labyrinth with our fingers. And then we traced a, a finger labyrinth because my mom had this neat little, just about this big finger labyrinth with the grooves so it's easy to follow. We traced that with our hands. We colored a labyrinth color in. And she was so excited that she was going to walk on a labyrinth that was big enough to stand on. Oh, my goodness. So we got to the labyrinth. She could hardly hold back. She's vibrating with excitement to get into the labyrinth. And, you know, it's also, it's full of people who are, like, really calmly taking off their shoes in a very controlled manner. And she's like, I've got to do this. It's going to be great. <laughs> so the harpist is playing in the background really calmly. And my daughter, I tell her, okay, you can get on it. And she's off and walking. So, okay, deep breaths, mom, deep breaths. I take a deep breath. I start my walk a few moments later. And I'm trying to keep my thoughts clear. And it's a meditative walking meditation. And then I look up and she's, she's a few turns ahead of me on the, on the labyrinth. And then she's not walking. She's dancing through the labyrinth. The, the, the harp music, and she's doing big gestures with her hands and turning and spinning. She didn't hit anybody, which is great. She, she was crossing the lines back and forth. She's not getting anywhere, but she's so happy. So Dan Johnson says that when you experience the labyrinth, many thoughts pass through your head. Am I doing this right? Will I mess it up? Life is circular. You end where you start. What thoughts are passing through my head? I spent my whole walk worrying about my daughter's walk. She's not walking right. How is she being received? Is she bothering people? Is she breaking the rules? Are there rules for the labyrinth? I lost the experience of my own walk because I was so focused on her walk. On the journey of life, you're going to cross paths with many different people. We're all on the same path. You can't worry about other people's lives because you don't have control over them. The only thing that I can do, and this is what I actually did, when she finally decided she was at the center of the labyrinth, I met her at the center of the labyrinth, and then I held her hand. And we talked about the labyrinth. And we made her experience, which was big and joyful, and my experience, which was smaller and less joyful. We made it into one experience of us together. I had her close her eyes and see if she could feel the difference between the painted lines and the plain canvas. And then I had her lead me a little bit, see if I could tell the difference between where the turns were, and how dizzying it is to be going in turns and spirals and turns and spirals because you think it's going to be straight and then life throws you another curveball. Well, the pattern we walked was actually a pattern called the Chart Labyrinth, and um, it's named after the style of labyrinth that's inlaid into the floor of the cathedral at Chartres in Paris. Um, which, again, I'm also mispronouncing, but I have a problem pronouncing French words. Sorry. Um, they think that they actually inlaid this, this particular labyrinth in the cathedral as a substitute for a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. So people who would not be, especially in the Middle Ages, not be able to get together the money and the supplies and the equipment that they would need to have a full pilgrimage to Jerusalem because that was, that was something that was considered a really good thing if you could do that. People would be able to instead make a pilgrimage to the Chartres Cathedral and then do a devotional walk of the labyrinth. Some people would walk it on their knees. Some people would take a prayer every step. 
Again, it's a labyrinth, so every person's journey is their own. Well, pilgrimage is a journey that's important in many religions. It's not just the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, which still people do. It's about two million people a year do the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Um, there are lots of other pilgrimages. Huffington Post will tell you the five biggest. And did you know over 100 million people go on pilgrimage every year to all the different, there's the 14 top sites get 100 million people a year. So being that this is through the lens of three different, uh, three different uh, languages, you know that my next pilgrim is going to be the Hajj, right? So um, the pilgrimage journey of the Hajj is the fifth of the five pillars of Islam. It's the journey that every sane adult Muslim must undertake once in their life if they are physically and financially able. And according to the Huffington Post, about 13 million Muslims visit the city of Mecca each year. And so even though the city of Mecca, this, this particular pilgrim, is limited to only followers of the Muslim faith, they still have 13 million a year. Um, in the Islamic tradition, the, the story of the founding of Mecca is actually pretty interesting. Muslims believe that the prophet Ibrahim was instructed to bring his wife Hajira, or Hagar, and their child Ishmael to Arabia from Palestine to protect them from Ibrahim's first wife, Sarah. And Allah told the prophet to leave them on their own, and he did so with food and water. But when the supplies ran out, the, the wife and the son started to suffer from malnutrition and dehydration. And in desperation, she ran, Hajira ran up and down the hills trying to find some kind of water, some kind of water, something, anything to save the life of her son. And she dropped her son, and his foot hit the ground. And where his foot hit the ground, a spring of water came out. And so Mecca was founded as a water town in the very, very dry, dry desert. They had a secure water supply, and they were able to tra trade for food with the passing nomads. So when, when people do the Hajj, they have many requirements that they have to do. They, they need to um, be wearing specific clothing. Interestingly, Muslim women who are um, observant and cover their faces, they must have their faces uncovered on the Hajj. I thought that was a very interesting part. Um, but the, the thing that I found really interesting was that um, the number seven is very important in the Hajj. You walk around the Kaaba seven times, repeating your prayers, and then you sip some Zamzam water. Zamzam is the name of the spring. And then you walk the hills of Safa and Marwa, just like Hajira did. You walk those seven times, and then you go on to your next part of the Hajj. But that number seven, the seven circuits and the seven passages back and forth, is the same number of turns that's in the Crete Labyrinth. So for another pilgrimage, this pilgrimage drawing on the Spanish language, I came up with Our Lady of Guadalupe Basilica in Mexico City, Mexico. So the way that this particular holy site was founded was that in 1531, um, a man named Don uh, Juan Diego, who was a poor Indian from Tepeyac, um, had a, a lady from heaven appear to him on a hill northwest of Mexico City. She identified herself as the mother of the true God and instructed him to have the bishop build a church on the site. And then she left an image of herself imprinted miraculously on his tilma, which is a cactus cloth, basically. Um, and it's very poor quality cactus cloth so it probably normally should have deteriorated within about 20 years. But after 470 years, it's still in pristine condition. And according to Catholic News Agency, to this day, it defies all scientific explanations of its origin. 
So what it's what the Catholic News Agency says is that this tilma reflects the message of love and compassion and a universal promise of help and protection to all mankind. And this is all written down in a 16th century document. So to complete our trio of pilgrimages in three languages, I searched for an American pilgrimage. Now there are, there are English pilgrimages, like the Canterbury Tales was written about in English pilgrimage, but we're in, we're in the US, I wanted to find an American pilgrimage. And did you know that we don't really, we are the most religious of the advanced nations, but we don't really have any pilgrimages. No really religious pilgrimages. There are a few that are sacred to a very small segment of Christian, mostly Catholic America, but there aren't any major ones that people from all over the world come to. But then I thought, huh, you know what? My focus is too narrow. I'm thinking only about religion when I think about pilgrimages. There are other places that people from all over the world come to. Niagara Falls, the Appalachian Trail, Yosemite National Park, all the, all the big national beautiful things that are natural in America. So I was, I was going to read um, the, other, the other story that I was thinking of reading by Christopher Buse was about walking in the woods. And he wasn't talking about walking the Appalachian Trail, although from Bill Bryson I do know that it is a life-changing experience. But what he said is, you start out and you're walking and you're in your own little world with the blinders on and you're just marching through the woods and then you look up and you notice that there are trees growing and there are birds in the trees and there are squirrels and there's water and there's air and it's all around you and all of these things will keep going on whether you meet the deadline or not. All of these things will keep going on whether you happen to get the right car that you've been researching online for the right price. The world is such a beautiful, big, wonderful place. And if you're really walking and watching for those signposts, signposts don't have to be made by people to be signposts. So we look for guiding signs. We look for the obvious ones that catch our attention right away. And then there are ones that pass and pass and pass, and suddenly we notice them and wonder why we never saw them before. As Carolyn Joy Adams said, your life is a sacred journey, and it's about change and growth and discovery and movement and transformation and continuously expanding your vision of what is possible, stretching your soul, learning to see clearly and deeply, and taking courageous challenges every step along the way. You are on the path. You're exactly where you're meant to be right now. And from here, you can only go forward, shaping your life story into a magnificent tale of triumph and healing and beauty and power and love. So just like Dory the Forgetful Fish in Disney's Finding Nemo, just keep swimming. No matter what choices you make, you're always on the path. Like a labyrinth, the path may twist and turn unexpectedly, taking you past your center again and again and going out when you think it should go in. But your journey is your journey. You cannot fall off the path because the path is in here. Thank you. And I'll play this once through before we sing it the second time around.
Tuesday for our annual meeting after that.